It's that time of the year. Your vacation is coming up. You can already hear the beach waves, feel the warm breeze, relax, and think about work. You really, really want it all to work out while you're away. Monday.com gives you and the team that peace of mind. When all work is on one platform and everyone's in sync, things just flow. Wherever you are, tap the banner to go to Monday.com. Look, Bumble knows you're exhausted by dating. All the, must not take yourself too seriously, and 6-1 since that matters, and what do I even say other than, hey? <sighs> well, that's why they're introducing an all-new Bumble. With exciting features to make compatibility easier, starting the chat better, and dating safer. They've changed, so you don't have to. Download the new Bumble now. Beware the Redwood Bureau, a secret organization which captures and researches creatures and objects that defy explanation. Their reckless procedures have led to countless innocent lives lost. I am Agent Conroy. I worked for the Redwood Bureau, but I have escaped them to leak their reports to the unsuspecting public. You have the right to know. Within the depths of the Redwood Bureau's classified archives lie secrets so unnerving they would make even the most hardened agents lose their composure. I should know I was one of them. Once part of that system, an agent is assigned to confront nightmares that most would consider unimaginable. Experts in criminology estimate that at any given time, there are up to 50 active serial killers operating within the United States alone. But what if I told you that the Bureau has files on entities far more insidious than any serial killer? Creatures that blur the line between the natural and the supernatural, challenging our very understanding of what it means to be human. During my years at the Bureau, I've faced monstrosities that defy all reason, entities that thrive in the dark corners of human comprehension. But there's one case that haunts me to this day, a string of murders so grotesque that they seemed less like crimes and more like twisted works of art. Victims meticulously skinned, their identities not just stolen, but erased as if they'd never existed. The only thing left behind, an untraceable, unidentifiable piece of a missing life. This was no ordinary investigation. It led us down corridors of darkness we never knew existed, opening doors to horrors that were beyond even the Bureau's understanding. And trust me, when the Bureau is stumped, you know you're dealing with something from the far reaches of a nightmare. The focus of this report is classified as Redwood Bureau Phenomenon 0074. This entity is known colloquially as the Skin Thief, a term that fails to capture the full scope of its malevolence. It doesn't just kill, it erases, it assumes, it becomes. A malevolent force so cunning that it has turned evasion into an art form, leaving only terror in its wake. This is a dire warning, a revelation of malevolent forces that defy our current understanding of the world. The entity's history is etched in blood and darkness, stretching back further than our records can trace. It forces us to confront a terrifying reality, that there are beings among us who defy every law and moral code we hold dear. We're not just fighting against unknown entities. We're fighting for the sanctity of our understanding of the world, a world that's far more fragile than we'd like to believe. This is an urgent call to re-examine everything we think we know about the boundaries of evil in human form. It's a dire warning about the hidden malevolent entities that share our world. Entities that could be standing right next to you, unseen, unseen. but ever present. Ever present. Life for me had always been painted in broad strokes of simplicity. A nine-to-five gig at the local accounting firm, weekends at the fishing hole, 
in evenings lost in a black and white world of classic cinema. Nestled in a quaint house on the quiet outskirts of a big city, I cherished the comfortable monotony. My closest neighbor was Jake, a guy who seemed as ordinary as a loaf of bread, as vanilla as I was. We did the neighborly thing, waving from our driveways, the occasional nod, quick chats about the weather, and that was it. But things took a peculiar turn one summer evening when Jake invited me over for dinner. Just a casual get-together between neighbors, he said. I molded over and accepted, feeling the situation harmless, maybe even a nice break from routine. Our initial dinner was nothing short of pleasant. Jake had culinary skills that would give any food network chef a run for their money. We talked about the grind at work, our little hobbies, and shared some genuine laughs. But as the night wore on, I noticed a certain aloofness in his gaze. It was like his eyes betrayed a secret, trying to claw its way out. I chalked it up to my imagination running wild, and pushed those thoughts aside. Little did I know that saying yes to a simple dinner invitation would send my world into a tailspin shattering the bedrock of my once normal and stable reality. As summer ambled into fall, dinners at Jake's became as routine as morning coffee. We cracked open beers, swapped tales from our youth, and bantered about everything under the sun. From our day jobs to the ambitions and dreams we've never said aloud. We talked about our families, past work experiences, and the next steps for us. However, with every passing encounter, I couldn't help but feel something was amiss. It started as tiny hiccups in the fabric of our interactions. A word that didn't roll off his tongue quite right. A gaze that lingered uncomfortably long after conversation had moved on. A chuckle that seemed to punctuate the wrong moment. I told myself they were just quirks, charming defects in the human condition. But these peculiarities began to nest in the darker corners of my mind, stubbornly defying my attempts to dismiss them. Then came an evening that added fuel to my smoldering suspicions. As I stepped out of Jake's house, I looked back through the window. There he was, locked in an intense stare with a framed family photograph on the wall. And the focus in his eyes was so sharp, it felt like he was trying to etch the image into his very soul. When he noticed me looking, he jerked away abruptly, almost guiltily. And that moment clung to me, an unease that I couldn't shake off like a haunting refrain in a minor key. As days blurred into weeks, my curiosity transformed into a low-key investigation. It started innocuously enough, replaying our past conversations in my head, scrutinizing his words, his expressions, searching for an explanation to my disquiet. That's when it hit me, the inconsistencies in Jake's stories were more than mere memory lapses or exaggerations. He'd casually mention a sister I'd never heard of before, or recount adventures from a trip he supposedly took years ago, a trip that I was certain never happened. It was like watching a movie where the actor flubbed his lines but carried on, hoping no one would notice. His emotional responses began to feel orchestrated, as if he'd rehearsed them in front of a mirror. I wrestled with my instincts, desperately trying to chalk it up to an overactive imagination. But the seed of doubt had been sown 
and was now a blossoming plant of suspicion that I couldn't just prune away. So I opted for cautious distance, observing Jake like a naturalist would a rare species. Blending skepticism with a dash of hope that I would find a benign explanation for all of these inconsistencies. But the more I observed from my self-imposed exile, the more pieces didn't fit. The man I thought I'd befriended was morphing before my eyes. Not physically, but in essence. It was as if the Jake I knew had been a mirage all along. Now dissipating to reveal a stranger wearing the same face, but wielding a different soul. And this stranger wasn't just a casual acquaintance. He was an observer, a collector of details. He knew my habits, my quirks, even my fears as though he'd been compiling a dossier on me. A persistent dread clawed at the corners of my mind as I went over all the information he'd collected about me. But, ultimately, curiosity overpowered fear. There was a sinister enigma wrapped in the guise of my next-door neighbor, and I was hell-bent on unraveling it even if it led me down a rabbit hole with no foreseeable end. Driven by an insatiable need for answers, I plunged headfirst into an amateur investigation, shaking down the digital cobwebs of social media, public records, and personal contacts. What emerged was a jigsaw puzzle missing half its pieces. Gaps in his employment history friends who responded to my queries with puzzled frowns, and even employers who had no inkling of ever hiring someone named Jake fitting the description of my neighbor. Taking it a step further, I visited the address he once casually mentioned as his mother's home. What I found was an empty shell of a house, its walls echoing with the silence of forgotten memories. My next stop was meeting his supposed sister, who met my questions with a bewildered gaze, adamantly denying the existence of a brother. Each clue unearthed only deepened the mystery, painting a picture so fragmented and surreal it would make Salvador Dali envious. So I embarked on a perilous mission to gather irrefutable evidence. I became a silent watcher, documenting inconsistencies, capturing odd behaviors on my phone, and digging deeper through public records that might expose him. Each piece of evidence felt like a double-edged sword, valuable, yet potentially damning if I was wrong. One night, while following him, I bore witness to an act that shattered any remaining illusions I had about Jake. He met with a stranger in an alley so secluded it seemed almost designed for nefarious deeds. My breath caught in my throat as Jake, or whoever he is, gripped the stranger by the neck and effortlessly lifted him off the ground. With an eerie calm, he snapped the man's neck and dragged the lifeless body into the abyss beyond the dim streetlight. I recoiled, my mind struggling to process what I'd just witnessed. It wasn't just the impossibility of the act itself, but the unnatural ease with which he'd done it. Jake was not just dangerous, he was lethal an apex predator in human guise. At that moment, I knew I was knee-deep in a situation far more twisted than I could have fathomed. Going to the police was no longer a straightforward option. I needed irrefutable evidence. Otherwise, 
I'd be dismissed as a paranoid nutjob. Worse yet, I had the unsettling feeling that if it came down to his word against mine, he'd somehow make me out to be the deranged one. After the alley incident, I was haunted by an inescapable truth. My neighbor wasn't just a man with a few quirks. He was something far more evil. But going to the authorities without solid evidence was a dead-end street. I'd end up discredited, possibly institutionalized, and he'd continue his horrors unimpeded. My fear was overwhelming, but I couldn't turn back now. I had been forced into a twisted game, and I couldn't shake the feeling that refusing to play wasn't an option. So I escalated my efforts, gathering digital breadcrumbs, consulting with witnesses, and assembling a portfolio that I thought could expose this monster's nefarious existence. Yet, with every piece of evidence I compiled, an insidious dread gnawed at me. The unsettling thought that I was not uncovering the truth, but rather being guided down a path meticulously crafted for me. I began to discern unsettling patterns in my neighbor's actions, an almost too deliberate of a trail, as if he was inviting me to dig and follow. Then, one night, an anonymous message popped up on my phone. A time, a place, and a cryptic promise of answers. Despite every instinct in me screaming not to go, my obsession had eclipsed reason. I had to know. I found myself standing in front of an abandoned warehouse armed with nothing but raw determination and a gnawing fear. Inside, it was a maze of shadows and echoes, the air thick with the weight of lives long lost. As I ventured further into this layer of nightmares, I stumbled into a room that stopped me dead in my tracks. It was a grotesque sanctuary filled with photographs, personal mementos, and horrifyingly, preserved human skins. In the eye of this storm of horror, I discovered a journal. Its pages were filled with a cold analytical study of human behavior. Sketches, notes, and observations that dissected emotions, fears, and desires. It was a manual for manipulation authored by the person I'd been living next to. Flipping through the pages, my thoughts spiraled into chaos. It wasn't only a record of past victims I was reading, it was also an analysis of me. My routines, my fears, my unspoken secrets. All dissected and laid out with surgical precision. A soft sound broke my concentration, a rustle, a whisper of movement. I spun around to find a figure in the doorway. It was Jake, or rather, the malevolent force hiding behind his face. Its eyes locked onto mine, its lips curving into a knowing smile. You've done quite well, it said its voice a dissonant lullaby of dread. But make no mistake, you were never in control. I've been pulling your strings like the puppet you are. Fueled by adrenaline, rage, and terror, I lunged. But it was two steps ahead, effortlessly dodging my attacks. It taunted me, Laughter echoing in the dimly lit space. I found myself backed into a corner, his form standing over me, seeming taller and thinner than I ever remember. Right before my very eyes, 
the thing that had been posing as my neighbor, my friend, peeled Jake's skin away and stepped out of it as something more evil and unexplainable than I ever imagined. It was dark, like the shadows around us, eyes reflective and animalistic with a deep red glow. It slowly raised itself, as if it had been hunched down and compacted into the skin suit it had been wearing for who knows how long. Seven feet, eight feet, nine feet. It kept rising, towering above me, thin arms so long they nearly touched the ground with their sharp jagged fingernails. The noise from my thudding heart was almost audible as I stared at the monstrosity, frozen in utter terror. It broke the silence, its voice raspy and wrong, something not meant to be listened to by human ears. Silly puppet, you've done nothing except for what I have allowed. Now you play your final part. And with those final, ominous words, it stepped back into the shadows and was gone, leaving me desolate and engulfed in dread. I staggered out of the warehouse, body shaking and head spinning. I couldn't put together a string of thoughts that even began to make sense of the situation. But it wasn't even close to being over. As I pulled down my street, everything was illuminated red and blue as the spinning lights danced off every surface visible from the street. I slowly pulled closer to my home, noticing the sheer number of police cars and uniformed officers lining the street. My mind broken from its stupor for the first time since leaving the warehouse. Before I could even reach my house, I was surrounded by screaming men pointing guns in my face. I was pulled from my car, slammed to the ground, and hauled away faster than I could understand what was happening. The trial was like a surreal horror show, where every move I'd made, every word I'd uttered, was contorted into a self-incriminating narrative. The knife I'd left at Jake's house after helping him with some minor home repairs was found at the scene of his fake sister's murder. My fingerprints, once a benign detail, were transformed into the mark of a killer. The GPS data for my car, inexplicably showing locations I'd never visited, providing a digital trail straight to the scene of multiple murders. The witnesses I'd spoken to, the locations I'd scoured, the evidence I'd collected, all of it weaponized to paint me as a psychopathic serial killer. Even the warehouse, a place that should have been my final confrontation with the entity, was staged to implicate me. Personal items I thought I'd lost, objects from my past, were all there among death and torture, placed to damn me further. I was declared guilty and handed a death sentence. My name indelibly stained with crimes I never committed. Overnight, I became a media pariah, disowned by my family, abandoned by my friends. The shocking revelation during the trial that Jake's skinned body was discovered hanging in my shower, rotten and mutilated, was the final nail in my imminent coffin. Now, confined within the cold walls of my cell where I await my execution, likely it will take years. I'm haunted by memories, terror and the relentless weight of injustice. The entity's words reverberate in my mind. Now you play your final part. 
I've come to the grim realization that I was never the protagonist. Never in charge of my own fate. Merely following the path laid out for me by something evil and terrifyingly intelligent. I was but a pawn suiting its purpose, serving as a scapegoat, while it continues to kill and destroy as it sees fit. Warning, signal interruption detected. This episode is sponsored by June's Journey. Attention all mystery lovers. Dive into the captivating world of June's Journey, the hidden object game that will awaken your inner detective. Join June Parker on her quest to uncover the shocking truth behind her sister's murder in the glamorous 1920s. I'm a couple of chapters in, and I love unlocking new pieces to the mystery after each hidden item search. The beautifully detailed scenes from New York's finest parlors to the charming sidewalks of Paris make the experience truly immersive. As you progress, you'll also get to build and customize your very own island estate, complete with stunning gardens and luxurious buildings. Gather compelling evidence, decipher cleverly hidden clues, and unravel the dark secrets of the Parker family. Each twist and turn will keep you on the edge of your seat, eager to crack the case. Cooperate or compete against other players in the detective club, and you'll even get a chance to play in a detective league to test your skills. Are you ready to jump back in time, detectives? Download June's Journey for free today in iOS and Android. Signal connection restored. 30 years in homicide, and the word routine still doesn't apply. Every murder's its own messed up universe, but this one, this one felt wrong right out of the gate. We found our first victim in a rundown building, skinned, like someone had just unzipped them out of their flesh. No fingerprints, no witnesses, just a cold case waiting for us to call it. It was my mess to clean up, simple as that. Then a month later, another one pops up. Same sick method, different dump site. It was like someone was moving through the city stage by stage, setting up for some kind of morbid exhibit. I've been over the evidence a hundred times. Photos, reports, you name it. Then it hit me. The weird puncture marks. The surgical skin removal. This wasn't just a murder. It was something planned, down to the last detail. And then there's the kicker. We'd just caged a serial killer not too long ago. Open and shut case, or so we thought. But the details in these new murders, way too similar. Felt like an echo of something we'd just put to bed. I sifted through the piles of evidence like a man looking for a needle in a haystack of needles. The deeper I went, the clearer it became. This wasn't just another sicko. This was something out of a goddamn horror movie. The name's Detective Robert Harris. I've been chasing monsters in human skin long enough to know when reality starts to look like a cheap paperback thriller. This case was putting all my years on the force, all my gut instincts, to the ultimate test. The second body turned up in some abandoned warehouse, laid out on cold concrete like a grotesque work of art. Standing over it, I could feel that familiar twist in my gut tighten into a knot. It was like walking back into a nightmare I'd just left. Looks like a damn replay, detective. Martinez muttered, his voice tinged with disbelief. Clean cuts, no scuffle. Whoever did this knows how to make a quiet exit. I scanned the dimly lit space, clocking every detail. Martinez, collect every scrap, every fiber. We've got another goddamn serial killer. Weeks bled into each other as the case sprawled into a tangled mess. 
I sifted through mountains of evidence, grilled witnesses, and ran down leads that led to more damn questions. In the weeds, knee-deep in evidence and witness statements that lead to more dead ends than a labyrinth. It's like the universe is laughing at me, and I'm the punchline of some cosmic joke. Then there's this sit-down with Dr. Simmons, the forensic guru. Look at these, I say, pointing at the photos of the victim's puncture marks. Same on each one. What's your take? Simmons leans in, adjusts his glasses like he always does when he's about to drop some science. These aren't just cuts. They're almost like signatures. But there's something else. Depth. Angle. It's not textbook. Hell, it's not even on the same syllabus. You saying you don't know what made this? I ask, my mind reeling with the implications. Not even close, he says. But there's more. After piercing into the body, these holes take a sharp angle in different directions. I've never seen anything like it. After talking to Simmons, I hit the files, hard. Nights became a blur of names, dates, and places. Shared employers, mutual friends, even random encounters at local events. Looked like a mess at first, but the more you dig, the more it starts making a sick kind of sense. I went back to those hell holes, the crime scenes. You can almost feel the killer's smug satisfaction hanging in the air. The city's freaking out, the press isn't helping. They're smelling blood and circling. I'm close, damn close, but every answer I find leads to ten more questions. Who's orchestrating this madness? What's their end game? How are they picking who's next on the chopping block? And the million dollar question, how the hell are they staying off my radar? I'll tell you this much, I'm up against someone who's making a sport out of making me look like a fool. They're always a step ahead. But don't think for a second that means I'm stepping back. This case isn't just a file number. It's become my damn obsession. I've got one goal. Pull back the curtain and find the freak pulling the strings, whatever it takes. The grind's wearing me down, nights turning into days. Victims' faces playing on a loop in my head. But every dark alley and dead-end lead gets me a step closer. I found myself in the archives, drowning in the dust and old newsprint. I wasn't sure what I was looking for, just a gut feeling gnawing at me, saying there's more to all this. Then I hit the jackpot, found a yellowed article from three decades back, another state, another skinless victim. Details matched up too well. My pulse kicked into high gear as I stumbled onto a trail of similar nightmares. It was like I found a secret chapter in the world's worst history book. A chain of horrors that stretched back to who knows when. Same MO, same freakish attention to detail. Started making calls, other PDs, eggheads in academia, even some profilers. Every rock I turned over made things worse. This wasn't one sicko I was chasing. It was like some deranged family tradition passed down through the ages. Or hell, maybe it was something even worse. Got a sit down with a historian, Jenkins. Guys into cold cases like some people are into vintage wine. You gotta see this, he says, flipping open some old tome. This kind of butchery isn't new goes back to medieval times, maybe further. I looked at the ancient text, my thoughts racing. So what's the pitch here, Professor? You're telling me this twisted act has been a classic for centuries? He shrugged, his eyes almost bugging out of his head. I can't say for certain, Detective. But when you line up all the dots, it's hard not to see the bigger, darker picture. The weight of what he was implying hit me like a freight train. This wasn't just a manhunt anymore. I was digging into a mystery that had roots going back who knows how far. 
This case had me stumbling into corners of the world I never even knew existed, uncovering secrets that felt like they should stay buried. I felt like I was onto something big, too big, maybe. The more I dug into this case, the more I felt like I was stepping on toes. Big, invisible, and probably dangerous toes. Wasn't the first time I'd pissed someone off, but this felt different. Look, I've stared down the barrel of a gun. Looked evil in the eye more than once, but this... This was some next-level dread I couldn't shake. Scratching the surface, hell, I felt like I was using a damn toothpick to carve into a mountain. The case turned into a black hole, swallowing time and sleep. It wasn't just the hours. Something was messing with my head. And then there's this woman. Keeps popping up everywhere like a recurring bad dream. Wrote it off as stress at first. What detective doesn't have that? But this was different. It was like she was haunting me in fleeting glimpses. She was there in the corner of my eye, the edge of my world. Street corner, parking lot, hell, even in front of my damn house. Like a shadow you can't shake. I tried to logic it away, stress hallucinations maybe? Case overload? But deep down, it was like my gut was screaming at me that I'd stepped into a predator's crosshairs. So, I did what I do best, dug through files like a madman, searching for something, anything, to make sense of this weird shit. Then I got my next big break. I'm searching through photos from that first case, and it hits me like a ton of bricks. That woman in the pictures, same eyes, same twisted smile. Feels like she's clawing her way out of the file just to mess with me. I don't know how I know, on account of the body having no skin, but I just know. One night, I check the street in front of my house, and my gut clenches. She's right there, staring back like she knows what I'm thinking. That smile of her sends a shiver up my spine. I tear out of my house, dead set on facing this head on. But the street's empty. Like magic, she's gone. That's when the weight of it all comes crashing down. I'm way out of my league here. This isn't just some perp playing games. This is some next level mind fuckery. The rule book's out the window now. I'm not just hunting a criminal, I'm fighting to keep my head on straight. Pressure's mounting, and not just from the brass or the media vultures circling overhead. It's internal. A drum beat in my head that gets louder with each dead end. I used to live for the chase, the hunt. But this case is turning that all on its head. Sleep's a distant memory, hell. I can barely remember the last time I had a decent meal that wasn't washed down with black coffee. My hands shake just a bit more each day. And I catch myself snapping at people who don't deserve it. I'm fraying at the edges, and it's not a good look. The evidence room's turned into my second home. I've got photos and case files spread out like a grim mosaic. A story told in blood and loss. Every name, every face, they're not just entries in a file anymore. They're part of my every waking thought and gore-filled dreams. And then there's her, that woman, or whatever she is can't shake the feeling that she's not just watching me, she's studying me, like a predator sizing up its prey. But in the middle of all this chaos, something finally gives. A clue. 
A real, solid lead that could be the key to unmasking this monster. And damn if it doesn't feel like the first breath of fresh air in months. A lead, a damn lead after weeks of chasing shadows. Hidden away, this place was like the city's guilty conscience, tucked far from prying eyes. It was a trap, had to be. But what choice did I have? This case had wormed its way into my very core. Time to go into the belly of the beast and see who comes out on top. I pull up to the building and it's like I've crossed into another world, one forgotten by time and ignored by the law. Every brick, every piece of chipped paint screams a history drenched in darkness and despair. The air is thick, heavy with the scent of rot and rust. The tension's more than palpable. It's a living, breathing entity. And it's got its icy grip around my spine. It's the calm before a hurricane, and I'm standing in the eye of the storm. The front door gives this god-awful creak as I push it open. Like the damn thing hasn't been moved in years. It's like the building itself is warning me, telling me turn back while I still can. But retreat's not in my vocabulary. Not now. My senses are at DEFCON 1. Every sound is a possible threat. Every shadow a potential enemy. My finger hovers over the trigger, ready to deal with whatever sick bastard waits in the dark, rotten depths of this decrepit tomb. Inside, it's pitch black, a labyrinth of unending corridors and rooms that look like they were designed by someone with a PhD in torture chambers. Every room's a potential kill zone, every corner a blind spot. I'm a seasoned hunter, but in here, I feel like prey. The feeling of being watched is unbearable. It's like I'm on a stage and the audience is just waiting for my downfall. Suddenly, a flicker of movement catches my eye, a flash in my periphery, there and gone in an instant. I whirl around, gun aimed, finger on the trigger, but there's nothing. Just an oppressive darkness that seems to swallow the beam of my flashlight. My heart is pounding like a drum solo, adrenaline turning my veins into highways. Every instinct is screaming at me, telling me that the show's about to start, and I'm the star of the next sick act. This was psychological warfare, a one-sided game of cat and mouse. And I was the damn mouse. Another door ahead, barely hanging off its hinges, creaks open with a sound that could have been ripped from a horror film. A gust of ice-cold air hits me like the building itself is exhaling. I step in, gun raised, and the room feels like it's holding its breath. Then all hell breaks loose. Something, fast as a bullet, silent as a shadow, lunges at me. I don't even have time to think. My finger pulls the trigger reflexively. Ears ringing as the gunshot's echo seems to bounce off the walls, filling the void with its deafening report. Whatever this is, it's on me in an instant. Shifting, dodging, attacking from all angles. This is no human. It's like I'm fighting smoke. But fight I do, drawing on reserves of strength and agility I didn't even know I had. Desperation makes for a powerful fuel. Every punch I threw, it deflected. Every shot I fired, it dodged. I felt like I was fighting a damn ghost. It was smarter, faster, and I was just tired. Every swing I took felt like swinging through quicksand. Every dodge I made felt a half second too slow. I landed a hit, finally, but it barely flinched. Instead, its form twisted, shifting in ways that defied reality. 
It counterattacked with a force that sent me sprawling on the ground, gasping for air. My gun skidded out of reach, landing in a dark corner far away. Time was a blur. My senses were scrambled. I could hear my own heart pounding in my ears, drowning out everything else. The creature seemed to grow in size, looming over me, its form a shifting mass of nightmares. I felt its malevolent glee, like it was savoring this. But the thought of giving up, letting this thing win, hell no. I pushed through the pain, through the bone-deep fatigue, and got back on my feet. I had to turn this around, one shot, and it was a Hail Mary at best. The thing lunged, its form almost blurring with speed, its intent clear, to finish this. Everything slowed down like one of those cliché moments in a movie. I dodged to the side, gripping a discarded pipe from the floor, and swung with every last ounce of strength I had. Jamming the rusty metal into the dark form, it recoiled, howling, and for a split second I thought, did I just win? Before the darkness rushed in. I found myself back at my desk, a neat stack of case files waiting for me, as if I'd never left. My phone buzzed, texts from the precinct, missed calls. They were wondering where I'd been, but I had a job to get back to. Isn't that what I always do? I started thumbing through the files, picking up where I'd left off. Each one a story, someone else's tragedy. But now, they felt more like opportunities. Yeah, that's it. Opportunities something else. Something that makes the night silence feel a little less empty. I looked up, catching my reflection in the glass pane that separates my office from the bullpen. Detective Robert Harris. A man who stared down the abyss more times than he cares to admit. But the abyss stares back, doesn't it? And sometimes, it does more than stare. I grabbed my coat, feeling its familiar weight settle on my shoulders. I've always said that a good coat is like a piece of armor. Protects you from the world and the world from you. I ambled toward my car, contemplating if it was finished yet. Who knows? I only knew that the night felt a bit more welcoming. The shadows cozier like a good coat. And even the monsters, well, let's just say we had reached an understanding. Phenomenon 0074, more unsettlingly known as the Skin Thief, is a case that continues to reverberate through the vaulted halls of the Redwood Bureau. Halls that are no strangers to horror and secrecy. You've just heard an account that offers a chilling glimpse into the entity's operations. But what we know is eclipsed by what we don't, making it one of the most unnerving and enigmatic cases within the Bureau's clandestine archives. The geographical and historical scope of the Skin Thief's activities is haunting. This is not a localized threat. This is a global, historical enigma. From the meticulously skinned corpses discovered in ancient catacombs to the inexplicable disappearances in modern-day rural communities, the signature of the skin thief is a morbid constant that defies time and nature. Scientifically speaking, the entity is an anomaly. Some in the Bureau have posited that it could be a form of life that is entirely foreign to our current biological understanding. Others suggest a more spectral origin. Yet its motives, be they survival, sadistic pleasure, or something far more incomprehensible, remain elusive. Its M.O. is an abomination, a violation of the human form and identity. It doesn't merely kill, it erases its victims from existence, 
assuming their roles with a horrific precision that suggests an intimate understanding of human psychology and behavior. The skin thief's evasion of capture is not a failure of law enforcement. It's an existential challenge. The phenomenon raises deeply disturbing questions about the very fabric of our reality. It's a manifestation of nightmares that are not confined to sleep, but are deeply embedded in the world we inhabit. The Skin Thief serves as a solemn reminder of our vulnerability and ignorance. We're not at the top of the food chain. We're not even alone. As you go about your daily life, bear in mind that this entity's operations are ongoing. Its legacy is not a closed chapter, but a growing volume in a library of human horror.